Hello, and happy Monday-ish. If I sound a little stuffy today, it's because, unfortunately, um, I've come down with something probably from caught from my son. So me and the tea right here. Oh, that's funny. My teacup, because it's black, is completely... Oh, there it is. It disappears. It comes back. That's funny. Anyway, I'm easily amused. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about, we're going to start getting into the different kingdoms, but we're kind of in, we're kind of talking more about domains slash kingdoms today. It's kind of that wonky place where it depends on who's doing what with the kingdoms. It's like if you're doing the five kingdoms, this is Kingdom Monera. But um, it's more like the two domains. So basically, we're talking about prokaryotes. Now, these guys outnumber us immensely, and they're all over the place. So that's why they're crazy important to talk about. And... Um, they can be really, really interesting and possibly the key to where life came from on Earth. Um, so we've got a lot to learn about these guys and we've found them pretty much everywhere. And I do mean that. So first thing I wanna do is click. All right, so this video, if you've never seen it, is hilarious. This is called The History of the Entire World, I Guess. Um, it does have some curse words in it, so I do apologize ahead of time, but um, it is kind of funny, and it is has a really funny start to everything, and we're going to watch a little bit of it. I, we don't have time to watch the whole thing. The whole thing's pretty long, because it gets into human history, but it starts with, you know, how we think the universe started, and how life came upon Earth, and it gets into funny things that I'm going to throw back to a lot so that's why i like using this video because it's a very funny representation of what happened and where life possibly or what we think currently came from so like i said please watch out for the uh, language i do apologize um but i find it haha -ha. so i might pause here and there about things oh whoops so now stars have cool stuff around like rocks ice Oh, I started it at a certain point. Oh. So anyway, if you want to watch it from the beginning, go ahead. But this is basically what's going on. And funny clouds, which can make some very interesting things. Like this ball of flaming rocks, for example. Oh, shit, we just got hit with another ball of flaming rocks. And it kind of made a mess, which is... Weather update, it's raining rocks from outer space. Weather update, those rocks might have had water inside them, and now there's hot steam in the sky. Weather update, cooler temperatures today, and the floor is no longer lava. Weather update, it's raining. Severe flooding alert, the entire world is now an ocean. Volcano alert. That's the ocean. What? Some things are not in the ocean. Oh, cool, like a plant or an animal? No, a microscopic speck. It lives at the bottom of the ocean and eats chemical soup, which is being served hot and fresh, made from gnarly space ingredients left over from when it was raining rocks or whatever. Oh, yeah, and it can do that. It has secret instructions written inside itself, telling it how to build another one of itself. So that's pretty nifty, I would say. Tired of living at the bottom of the ocean? Now you can eat sunlight. Using a revolutionary technique, you can convert sunlight into food. Side effect, now there's oxygen everywhere and the sky's blue. Then the earth might have been a snowball for a while, maybe even a couple of times. It's a sponge. It's a plant. It's a worm and some other types of weird, strange water bugs and strange fish. It's the Cambrian explosion. Wow, that's animals and stuff. But we're still in the ocean. Hey, can we go on land? No. Why? The sun is a deadly laser. Oh, okay. Now the animals can go on land. Come on, animals, let's go on land. Nope, can't walk yet. And there's no food yet, so I don't care. Okay, will you learn to walk if there's plants up here? Maybe, said some bugs and fish. <laughs> okay, so I can go on land, but I have to go back in the water. Okay, we'll stop there because this is starts going into where the different kingdoms kind of arise from. So anyway, as you can see, um, again, we're not entirely sure where or how because we're still trying to work that out because that's the beautiful thing about science we don't know everything and we're going to admit that any good scientist will admit that but um as you can see 
uh, life started from a microbe that was hanging out down eating chemical soup in primordial earth. And nothing really went up on land for a very long time because the sun was a deadly laser. And we're going to go over that quite a bit. So. No, no. So now stars have cool stuff around. Them, like rock. Next. Thank you. Next page. So anyway, so bacteria are everywhere. Now, as you saw in the video, microbial bats are large bio, um, bio uh, films. Um, basically, this is a huge microbial community held together by a gummy textured matrix. It's fun, sticky soup, but they like to live in it. And they may represent the earliest forms of prokaryotic life on Earth. And there's fossil evidence of these guys about 3.5 billion years ago. And um, a microbial mat is a multi-layered sheet of prokaryotes that basically include bar, uh, bacteria, bar, archaea. Now, archaeas are the weirdos. They're, they're really primitive compared to bacteria. Archaeans also are extremophiles, and I'll get into this a little later, they can pretty much almost survive in places that life cannot survive in. We've even found castings of them on um, uh, asteroids. Anyway, or at least uh, meteorites. Excuse me. Anyway. So these used to be only like a few centimeters thick and they typically grow where different types of materials interface and it was usually in swamps. And I actually uh, grew up um, living on top of these guys or at least the fossil evidence of these guys. And I'd like to show you where I used to grow up in upstate New York and upstate New York used to be a, uh, a haven for these guys 3.5 million years ago. So these guys are not, you know, something that we don't know about. And this is just a guess. We actually have their footprints and this is what they look like. So I literally lived on top of these guys. You'd dig anywhere in the soil around my house and you'd run into a whole sheet of these guys. So these are called stromatolites. And um, as you can see, I used to call them the circle things when I was a kid growing up, because we you could dig one up, no problem, where I was. And um, this is what's left of those microbial mats. So, um, and uh, it over time turned into a sedimentary structure formed on the minerals that participated out of the water and turned them into these cool fossils. And um, a couple of years ago, I got to go back to my home, my old home up in New York, and um, I was showing my son all of these things. And um, so here's some of those different things, again, about Lester Park, which is off on the side of the road in you know the middle of upstate New York in a strange area. So it's actually really interesting um, that, yeah, these guys are actually under our feet. All the evidence of these guys, especially in certain areas, definitely upstate New York, which, like I said, 3.5 million years ago was just a big old fat swamp and some parts of it haven't changed. So anyway, so it's a fossilized sea bottom. And um, unfortunately, it is a part of a uh, New York uh, Museum, but the problem is uh, it's worth more in the ground than, um, and then it is being dug up and preserved. So that's why they made these parks. But the problem is just down the road, I'm not kidding you. And this is something that I had, my parents, when I was growing up, were constantly fighting with, with the rest of the neighbors. There is a stone quarry and they have an open pit kind of blow up, blow it up. And unfortunately they love blowing this stuff up. And so there's not only, uh, you know, a lot of the land is owned by New York State Museum, trying to protect it but the problem is they keep encroaching and that pit just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger for more and more gravel so we had to fight it all the time because i mean it would rock the house when they would do uh explosions we'd be sitting there and all of a sudden boom i mean they'd let us know but at the same time it was just like oh my god so there is a fight to save these guys a lot so anyway but these are pretty cool. So these are cyanobacteria mats, often called blue-green algae. And the layers re reflect the growth spurts of the mats that corresponded with tidal cycles. 
So um, some of these actually you can find uh, snails, trial bites, and brachiopods found in between the stromolites if you're lucky. Uh, my grandma, who's a rock hound, she loves looking for trilobites. She's always looking for trilobites, which is why when we were wandering around, she was poking at the ground, always looking for a trilobite in between the stromolites. So it was it was fun. So and the thing it mentioned the Cambrian explosion, which was a huge life explosion that that branched out in many different ways and. So that's where these guys right here, the Lester Park stromolites, so the oldest fish, first trilobites, origin of modern marine animal groups. So we'll get into the Cambrian explosion in a bit. So anyway, a lot of different crazy things going on. And the pre-Cambrian, which is fun stuff. So yeah, oldest bacteria fossils, which you can find, especially up and down us East Coasters, because um, we've got a lot of really interesting fossil groups up and down, even here in North Carolina. So, I don't know. Anyway, there's another picture of my son walking through, and you can see all the stromolites, all the microbial mats. That was pretty much some of the first life on Earth. And some random guy that happened to be there, too. Hmm. Anyway, so once upon a time, archaea and bacteria were thrown into Kingdom Monera. And now we split them up. And yet, here I am again in these notes, clumping them back together, um, just for sanity's sake, really. Um, I don't want you sitting there and going, oh, my God. So I kind of clumped them together because uh, if we wanted to split them up and go ad nauseum through this, I'd probably, yeah, we could. But, you know, we want to save our sanity as much as possible. You know what I mean? So anyway, so prokaryotes. So these guys have no membrane-bound nucleus or organelles. Uh, they're single-celled. Um, they're further classified by their nutritional class and their reactivity with oxygen. Because some of these guys like oxygen, some of these guys hate oxygen, and some of these guys don't care if they have it or not. So that's what the three groups of reactivity with oxygen. So we've got the ones that hate it, the ones that love it, and the ones, you know, and can't live without it. And then the ones that are in between that just don't care if they have it or not. They'll live, they'll be fine either way. So instead of phyla or divisions, we often classify them into strains. You've probably heard that before. If you've been ever heard of, you know, bacterial infections, and it's like, oh, it's the strain. Yeah, that's how we classify these guys. And bacteria can either be heterotroph, which means they have to go eat other bacteria, or autotrophs, like that one thing uh, showed that, yeah, you can eat, you can turn the sun into food. Um, they were like, the originals were chemotrophs, those ones, uh, chemoautotrophs were the ones that were down in the uh, eating that chemical soup, that hot, fresh chemical soup that's coming up through the vents from the... Uh, mantle into the crust at the bottom of the ocean and there's a lot of creatures that still do that to this day and we'll talk some about them when we get there because i like talking about the freaks that are down in the depths of the ocean that we barely know anything about it's spooky down there anyway so again like i said we got them named depending on how they react to oxygen so obligate anaerobes these guys require oxygen they have to have it they need oxygen to grow and survive. Obligate anaerobes, remember an means not or none. So aero means air, to needs air. So obligate aerobes means they need air because aero means needing oxygen. Obligate anaerobes, and means no air. So obligate not actually must avoid oxygen. They actually will die in the presence of oxygen. And facilitative uh, or facultative facultative, excuse me, anaerobes can use oxygen when it is available, and they can also do without. So they're the ones that are just like, yeah, okay, it's great if I have it, but if I don't have it, yeah. So as you can see, we've got some very basic uh, parts to these guys. We've got, you know, they have a cell membrane, which does make them, you know, a cell. They have uh, DNA. It's usually, uh, they have a nucleoid region where they like keep their DNA, but they don't have a nucleus. So no nucleus, remember that. Their ribosomes are just hanging all over the place, working with the DNA. 
Um, they've got these little sticky outy things all over there. They're called fimbrae. They also have a capsule. Some of them have a cell wall and a capsule, which makes them like really, really uh, adept at living in harsh environments because uh, there's no way, you know, between the capsule and a cell wall, there's just no way anything's going to get through to harm it. Um, so you, that's why you can see these things in like, you know, arid, arid areas where they go dormant for years and then they hit water and they wake back up and multiply, multiply, multiply. Um, you'll see some of these guys living in uh, hot acid pools out in Yosemite, which, by the way, do not go skinny dipping in hot acid pools in Yosemite. Apparently, <laughs> I've got so many stories of that. Um, yeah, there was this one group that apparently... Uh, likes to go skinny dipping in hot springs, which is fine, uh, but not in Yosemite because the hot springs are also acid springs. Oh, not good. So apparently one guy went skinny dipping and dipped into the wrong one and died. Yeah, and um, the problem is you die quick. Uh, maybe not painlessly, but pretty fast. And the thing is, we can't get your body back. Uh, it dissolved within a couple of days. So, yeah, it's a good place to get rid of bodies, I guess. But even though a lot of people are going to see you go in because those things are insanely popular. Good luck finding a hot acid spring that isn't, you know, surrounded by, uh, you know, forest service people. Anyway, there was also one that, unfortunately, there's there's one that says no dogs or, or any animals on leashes allowed because, unfortunately, they have a bad habit of, if you know, the dog doesn't know. And this is a true story. There was a guy that had, uh, him and his friend went and they brought one of their dogs and him and his friend were just wandering around. They let the dog off the leash. The dog ran into the acid bath. Uh, the owner of the dog ran after the dog trying to rescue it and died doing both the dog and the owner died and the friend tried to save the owner of the dog and he got burned over like 30 percent of his body he lived but still keep your animals on leashes in yosemite thank you all right so now some of those strains i was talking about earlier um, we usually chalk them up to shapes so there's the uh round shaped ones we call them caucus or cockeye. Yeah, haha. -ha. Anyway, sorry. Used to my high schoolers going, and I'm like, I'm going to have to. So, anyway, uh, rod shaped are bacillus or bacilli. Uh, spiral shaped are called spirillium. And then there's one with like a rod shape but a tail, and they're called. Uh, Vibrio. So there's a lot of different um, shapes to these guys. And that's usually where we kind of, you know, break them down into their various strains is usually like, and you can see that in their naming um, things. So like, for instance, um, sorry, my sick brain is trying to turn wheels and the neurons are not waking up. So stuff, uh, staff. So staphylococcus, um, it literally is in the name. Staph. So you know, if anybody's had a staph infection, I hope you haven't. But if you have and you've got a fix, it's staphylococcus. So caucus means that staph is in a round shape, all over the place. So usually you find the uh, shape name in the name of the uh, bacteria in question. So. Let's talk about archaeobacteria. So these live in extreme environments. They're called extremophiles. There's a bazillion different types. Um, ones I like to talk about, the halophiles. These are salt lovers. So these are like the only things found living in like the, uh, the Dead Sea because they just love, they don't mind living in that much salt. It's just like awesome. Uh, they're also in the Great Salt Lake in Utah. If there's a lot of salt, these guys are hanging out. Um, methogens, these produce uh, a methane as a byproduct. Interestingly, you find them in a lot of uh, animals that are herbivores, so like cows. And that's why cows uh, fart a lot of methane. 
they do they do um thermoacophiles they love hot acidic environments so again we've got the acidophiles they love acids we've got the alkaliophiles which these guys like bases so base an example of a base would be like ammonia um uh lye because i actually do make a soap myself and lye a lot of people think it's an acid it's not it behaves like one because but it's like on the opposite of spectrum remember on the ph scale so you got your ph scale remember in the middle is uh water because it's ph of seven which means it's neutral it's neither an acid nor a base and the further you go away from seven on either end, the more dangerous it becomes. So therefore, if you're going towards lower numbers, it's acidic. So, uh, you know, something with an acidity, acidity of one is actually quite dangerous. Whereas, you know, something with the acidity of six is something we like called soda. Mm. Or, you know, because we do like eating, um, you know, lemons and stuff and citrus fruits. They're usually around a pH of two. And I know it's strange, but we really love eating acids. Uh, and actually, the acidic taste actually uh, lets us know it's it's good for us. So that's why we're attracted to acidic tastes. But if you go to the higher numbers on the other end, uh, we actually uh, stay away from that because it usually means it's uh, poisonous. Uh, it tastes bitter to us, and that actually repels us. So that's why we don't eat bitter things because it makes us go blah, 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 because um, it's our body's way of saying that's probably a poison, spit it out, dummy. So how we react to acids or bases with taste is actually really interesting. Uh, I'm getting off topic. Anyway, but yeah, if you go up to like 14, that's just as dangerous as like a negative one acid. Um, and that's lie. Um and I have a crazy story about lye. When I was in high school, um, there was a party. And like I said, lye is used to make soap. A lot of people, if you make soap yourself or your parents make soap or somebody in your family made soap, um, you might already know this. Lye uh, is also the main ingredient in Drano. Um, it's not, it's not, uh, it will burn. It will chemically burn you. Um, in the, uh, in the movie Fight Club, at uh, one point, he burns himself with lye. So that was not an acid he used to burn his hand in that movie. It was actually lye. So, um, which, like I said, is really powerful and really will do a number on us. So the story goes, or maybe because I know the story, <laughs> I was, um, there was a party and I wasn't invited to it because I was a stick in the mud that night. Wouldn't have gone anyway. It was all a bunch of people that I didn't really hang out with. Um, and I barely do. So there was a party. And apparently during this party, high schooler age party, you know, parents were away. Um, uh, they ran out of alcohol. So what does a bunch of drunk teenagers do when they run out of alcohol? They go look for more alcohol. So they went downstairs because one of the kids was like, hey, there's another refrigerator downstairs. Let's go check that out. So they went downstairs. And um, apparently the mom liked to make soap. And um, fortunately, there was a whole bunch of glass uh, jugs sitting in the fridge. So they assumed it was white lightning and it's not, it was lye uh, because lye works best when you're making soap in it's liquid form. It will burn itself out. It will eat away and get out of a plastic container. But the reason we kind of keep it in uh, glass is to contain it safely. Uh, but at the same time, why is it in the refrigerator? Because it works better when it's colder when you make soap. Um, makes a higher quality soap so that's why unfortunately they thought it was white lightning and it was not it was a uh, lie and so a kid grabbed one of the jugs popped the top and took a swig and started screaming or choking and the others thought he was just being a you know oh. so another one grabbed it and he barely took it yeah, another two grabbed some and barely took a swig when they noticed the first guy was just absolutely 
losing it and blood coming out and yeah so three of them got like when well, the one kid that took the big swig he lost his tongue and had to eat through a uh, tube in his stomach for the rest of his life uh the other kids yeah they had some major damage done to their mouths chemical burns so it was not it was not pleasant it was not pleasant uh at all so just saying always check before you see what's in that jug do not just swig so anyway that's my story i've got it keeps getting off here so anyway um hyperthermophiles these guys like insane temperatures um these guys are psychrophiles which means they actually like it colder um osmophiles enjoy a high sugar concentration so that's where a lot of these guys lie um so archaeobacteria are like some of the most primitive but they're also built for just living in deranged areas because if you think about it primordial earth was not a happy place to live if we got into miss royal's magic school tank because you know i want a tank not a school bus um and we went back in time um we'd actually have to wear protective suits with oxygen um much like you know it would actually be worse than going into space because um there was no oxygen back then earth was pretty pretty wild and lots of heat lots of lightning lots of gases that would kill us the minute we took tried to take a breath if we didn't have protective gear on so yeah that's kind of where these guys you know and then after that there's still areas left over on this planet that are just like nobody else wants to live there so these guys are just like yeah we're good we're good like the uh, acid springs and uh, yosemite that's actually why they have all those pretty pretty colors let me get another tissue hold on pretty pretty colors excuse me anyway so here we go so here's some of these guys so the urio kerata so these are methogen methogens and halobacteria as you can see these guys uh these guys like the sulfur mm. um these like they live at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, interestingly enough, you can find them around hydrothermal vents um, or in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, they actually live as a symbiote with another species of archaea, which is interesting. So these are the different phylum inside of. So again, these are the methane guys and the saline. They like the salt and the methane. These guys are the uh, sulfur dependent and a lot of them like to hang out in psychotically hot areas. This group right here, the Nano Archaeota, um, only has one. And like I said, he likes to live in thermal vents and things like that. And this guy right here is most primitive. And they're found only, only uh, have only been found in the Obsidian Pool, the Hot Spring in uh, Yosemite National, uh, Yellowstone National Park. So Yellowstone. Yeah has a lot of the craziness go to yellowstone see the bacteria don't swim with the bacteria that would be bad all right so we believe there at one point there's some universal ancestor um that we don't really have any kind of um fossil record of because they're so tiny and teeny and We've also, we're going to talk about later, um, entire times where uh, we've had mass extinctions on the planet. We've actually been through six. Um, we're actually going through the sixth right now. And we'll get back to that later. So that's why sometimes we have a lot of fossil evidence and then sometimes we have no fossil evidence. It's kind of an interesting thing. And what happened is that universal ancestors split and split and split and we get domain eukaryota we got domain archaea and domain bacteria. So yeah, interestingly enough, archaea split and possibly eukaea, eukarya, the, or us eukaryotes came out of a possible uh, related ancestor at one point. So fun stuff, fun stuff. All right. 
protobacteria. Now, again, proto means first, proteobacteria. So these guys are, you know, subdivided into several classes from alpha to epsilon. And then we got zeta down here too. I'm not even going to beat you with this. I just want you to know, yeah, we actually just named these after, you know, uh, Greek letters. So these are thought to be descendants of alpha protobacteria where eukaryotic chloroplasts derive from cyanobacteria. So we think our mitochondria came out of this, this group because our mitochondria, remember, has its own DNA. Um, we actually get them from our mom. Um, and um, they, they act like their own little uh, selves. They're in, inside of a bigger cell. So what we, what we think happened one day was basically a big cell just said, hey, you can live inside of me and I'll protect you from the outside world if you if and I'll give you all the glucose you can possibly all the glucose and oxygen you could possibly was uh, want if you make some me some of that sweet sweet ATP and uh, the mitochondria was like you're on bro as long as I get to keep my own DNA and the bigger cell was like heck yeah come on in and so that's what happened and they merged and that's where we got uh, mitochondria um, and that had to have happened first before um, plants uh, figured out uh, chloroplasts because they need the mitochondria to turn all that glucose they're making through photosynthesis into ATP still. So I think the that step came first, maybe? Keep in mind, things are always changing with research on this. Um, bacteria are divided into two major groups, which is basically gram positive and gram negative. If you take micro uh, here, you'll be getting into this big time. So if you go ahead and take uh, micro with uh, Dr. Huls, uh, yeah, you'll be um, you'll be uh, learning all about gram positive and gram negative. So basically, what that means is they're a reaction to gram staining. So not all gram positive bacteria belong to one phylum. So if it's gram positive, it stains. If it's gram negative, it doesn't stain. And because of that, we can see, you know, uh, if it stains, we can see all its parts and everything. Um, if it doesn't stain, then yeah, can't really see much. Although we've gotten better so that's how we split them out, whether or not they can stain or not. Um, now, a lot of them are gram negative. It's actually kind of rare. Um, that they, I mean, the ones we can stain are usually also the ones that we can, and I hope I am getting this right, but like I said, my brain's a little bit slowed down from me getting a touch of whatever the heck my son gave me this weekend. Um, a lot of the majority of the bacteria on this planet, we cannot culture, which means we can't grow it on a little, uh, you know, Petri dish and stare at it. Um, we don't know what they require. We don't know what they need. So it's it's hard sometimes to try and study these guys because you've got to study them in the wild. But at the same time, it's hard to single them out to study them in the wild. It's a it's interesting. Um Interestingly enough, a lot of the bacteria, we actually um, have a very hyper sense of smell about bacteria uh, as humans. I know we get uh, trounced on by, you know, looking, you know, measuring ourselves against dogs. Um, but, you know, that smell that um, comes after it rains uh, during the spring and the summer and you walk out and everything's breathing and you can smell the dirt. And that wonderful, wonderful smell. I love it. That's just like, and that's a thing that humans can detect because it signals to us that that earth is healthy and ready to plant. So we are hyper aware of um, if we've got good dirt or not around us for cultivating uh, our uh, crops. So interestingly enough, we've developed over the centuries uh, hyper awareness to uh, smelling bacteria in the dirt. So uh, the gram positives that live in the dirt in this group right here, um, 
we really like smelling them and we're very highly attuned to smelling them. Um, other animals can't say that because they don't, <laughs> they don't plant crops. So it's interesting. Um, so yeah, we, we actually do have a specialization as humans with smelling. And one of them is smelling bacteria in the dirt and it makes us happy. Um, it actually, uh, makes us, so those of you that like gardening, like I do playing in fresh dirt, it smells so wonderful. It actually uh, shows to elevate our uh, our dopamine in our systems because we react to that smell and it actually, our bodies go, yay, healthy dirt. And it stimulates happiness in us because we know we can plant crops in that and we'll get food and that's all good. So yeah, uh, soil, actually the, my, uh, the bacteria in soil makes us happy. Yay! Now, some bacteria in us does not make us happy. It makes us sick, but we'll talk about them in a minute. So gram positive, gram negative. Here we go. Let's get into this. So basically all cell walls vary uh, between archaea and bacteria and between the different species. And bacteria cell walls called uh, peptidoglycan, which is basically these huge chains, polysaccharide chains cross-linked by unusual peptides. And it says L and D amino acids. So what do you mean by the L and the D here? Well, that goes to chemistry. So if you're not taking chemistry, let me give you a quickie crash course into chemistry. And that is this. For the longest time, we thought that chemicals were just that. H2O is always going to be H2O, and it is. Um, but anytime a uh, chemical forms a bunch of chains, uh, we just thought it was always in one direction and that didn't matter. And this brought us to a lot of problems um, in making drugs in the 1950s. I like to call the 1950s, the era right after World War II, the we're, get, we, we're doing so much with science, but no ethics. Um, because they didn't stop to ask you know, they all they asked was, could we? They did, but they never asked, should we? And that came back to bite us. And this is one of the things. So some chemicals, when you synthesize them in a lab, they actually make a left configuration and a right configuration. And that's what that L and D kind of stands for, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. Basically, it's where these guys are sticking out. And for the longest time, we thought it was the same. We thought, hey, it's, you know, mirror images of each other. That's the same. No, actually, we found out through some of the first birth controls we made um, that uh, one would actually act like a birth control and the right, you know, like the left would act like a birth control and the right would just cause uh, ovarian cancer. Good job. Now they put out, um, they put out the drugs with both the left and the right in it, and lo and behold, yeah, it kind of, you know, worked as birth control, but it also kind of gave anybody who was using it ovarian cancer, so smooth. So it wasn't until we had to recall all that, go back to the drawing board, look at it again and go, okay, maybe these left and right orientation um, chemicals actually are different and it's true i actually synthesized this in the lab because i had a minor in chemistry silly me um and um i actually synthesized if you synthesize it cor correctly you make um uh peppermint flavoring if you don't you make something that will cause cancer yeah so yeah the left side the left orientating one makes peppermint taste and the right orientating one makes cancer. So yeah, there's an added layer. Like I said, I go back to the 1950s a lot because we unfortunately did a lot of stupid, stupid science in the 1950s. Just stupid science and some good science. It was such a cluster because we, like I said, we were like, yay, science, which was all good and well, but nobody went, yay, ethics. You know, 
Anyway, so gram positive, basically the innermost plasma membrane has a very thick cell wall, outer capsule. It's more easily uh, treatable with antibiotics and it stains purple violet after a gram stain. So gram negative, the innermost plasma membrane um, is a polypeptide thin cell wall, has another plasma membrane. So these guys have two plasma membranes. They have an outer capsule hard to treat with antibiotics and stains red pink after a gram, gram stain. So these guys, purple, red. We can deal with these, we can't. So that's why I talked about the viruses last week because we're looking at you know attacking some of these guys with uh, bacteriophages. Oh, and I brought my, my hold on, I brought my plush and bacteriophage. Stole them back from my son. He's got plenty of plushies. Here, here's my bacteria fish. Hello. And I also have uh, the Black Death, which is a bacteria. Hello. Yes, I am that easily abused. And I hope you are too. All right. So, anyway. So how do these guys reproduce? They basically go through mitosis, but they call it uh binary fission for these guys. So um, it is mitosis in a nutshell. We just call it binary fission for these guys because it's a little bit, so they make two identify, uh, identical clothes. So how do bacteria exchange DNA? Well, there's a couple of different ways. Um, some of these guys, what they do is they'll actually make, it's kind of like DNA trading cards. If, 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 if any of you used to do the Pokemon game or if you're like me and you play Magic the Gathering, of course, you don't trade much with Magic the Gathering. Usually when you buy a card, it's yours. <laughs> but like, say you're trading cards. So they do this with loops of DNA. And it's actually what we use to mess with their DNA a lot. Um, because they have, a, a perchance, they like to pick up these loops. So what happens is like one, D, uh, one bacteria will eject a loop of extra DNA they've got. And another bacteria will swing by and pick it up going, oh, I don't have that. And they pick it up and add it to their own DNA. That's called transformation. So they literally go pick it up and going, oh, I don't have that type of DNA yet. And it's like trading cards. They literally sometimes will get next to each other and that's conjunction. Well, they literally will trade loops of DNA. So that's conjunction. They'll come side by side, make a bridge and then um, trade DNA back and forth, what they have, what they don't have. So um, another way is through viruses, as you can see, bringing our friend bacteriophage in. Oh, well. Um, the bacteriophage injects the DNA, and that's called transduction. So that gives them some DNA sometimes that they usually don't want, but sometimes they've kept for reasons we'll get into in a minute. So that's how two identical... Um, uh, clones uh, survive with diversity is that, you know, somebody gets some DNA that he didn't have previously and he hands it over to another friend. Now, some bacteria have um, taken advantage of this. Um, some, you know, by going, hey, I found this bacteria and it was really the DNA from a virus. Anyway, so again, the fun war between Viruses and bacteria is actually quite interesting. So as you can see, there's many different ways bacteria will literally trade DNA with each other. Now, the process of culturing bacteria is complex and one of the greatest discoveries so we can actually mess with these guys in a lab because messing with them out in the wild is not exactly easy. So we can thank um, German uh, physician Robert Koch um, is credited with discovering the techniques for this uh, to make cultures, including straining and using growth media. This is stuff that if you take microbiology, um, you'll learn more about. If you don't, don't worry about it. Um, other than, you know, I'm just touching on it. So use a culture, appropriate culture medium containing all the nutrients they love. And then we it could be a liquid, a broth, or a solid. Um, and then you put it in the right temperature. That's why we have... Um, Basically, it's a little mini, oh, well, it's actually kind of a largish 
oven that just gets the right, just right, makes them nice and happy and give them just enough food and then they can make a ton of themselves. And then we can go from there. And coach's assistant, Julius uh, Petrie, invented the Petri dish, which basically everybody uses it. You know, it's that circle and then we, you know, the jelly looking stuff and then we scrape it on and then you can grow stuff. Um, hopefully your biology teacher did something with you like that. Um, if not, don't worry. Um, it's just, we used to be able to do that stuff and then they keep going, oh, no, 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 teach to the test. Uh, trust me, as an educator, I can go on and on about that but i'm not going to it's gonna be good so unfortunately over 99 percent of bacteria and archaea are unculturable these guys we don't know what to feed them so they just go yeah no i'm not doing it <laughs> and we're like no no please come with us to the lab we want to study you and love you and and figure out new ways to make you do things that we want you to do and, uh, and they're like no so, you know, Mother Nature, once again, goes, no. All right, so these organisms that cannot be cultured are, um, but are not dead are in the viable but non-culturable states. So V, B, N, C. Um, yeah, there's a name for you. So this basically occurs when the prokaryotes respond to environmental stressors and it throws them into a dormant state. So they like, you know, harden up and just go into a sleep state. And uh, and when you give them uh, what they need to live again, they go into resuscitation. Well, they come back out of this process and go into a normal when envir uh, environmental conditions improve. And this was a response to, you never knew, you know, the same thing with us. You never know what the weather is gonna do or how many Chinese weather balloons are floating over North Carolina. Anybody see it this week? I'm just curious. Anyway. So long story short, yeah, that's what they do. They go into this dormant state for survival and then they'll resuscitate. And it's not entirely understood how they do this um, because we'd love to give them in the lab and learn how to do it by triggering them, but we can't get them in the lab to trigger them. Hmm. So yeah, it's, it's kind of hard when we can't drag these bad boys into a lab and check them out um you know because you have to wait on the weather to do it for you out inside and that's so many variables you can't control and that just doesn't make for good science so maybe one day we'll figure them out anyway so there's major nutritional modes again there's photo autotroph these are the guys that do photosynthesis uh like plants um basically cyanobacteria uh, algae actually we'll talk about algae next week because those are that's in the protist dimension um chemo autotroph these guys live on inorganic chemicals so for instance the ones that live down in the o bottom of the ocean where the ocean uh, where those events are that makes delicious chemical soup for them to suck up and eat heterotrophic uh, means they're uh, attracted to light so if they they don't use light to make food but they do actually go uh find somebody else who's emitting light and try to eat them chemotrophic again uh this is many prokaryotes that like to hunt down other prokaryotes by following their chemical trails so yum 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 eat other bacteria of course then again we do eat bacteria if you've ever eaten yogurt in your ever life congratulations you've just eaten a whole bunch of bacteria which was really funny because I had a, a teacher uh, in the eighth grade and I think I got kicked out. I don't remember much of his class other than he was in once. And he was one of those people, like I said, if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, I'm not knocking on you or the whole practice because there's plenty of people out there who do it because of dietary restrictions or, you know, their choice and it's all good. Uh, that it, it's always the one group that always lords it over the other groups. And that's true for any group. That can be such a turnoff. Um, and he was one of those teachers. He was one of those ones that sat there and he was just like, well, I'm a vegetarian. Do you know what that means? And we're all just like, and he was eating yogurt, which was killing me. 
and we were all sitting there going yeah it means you don't eat meat and you don't eat you know so he was like i don't eat living animals and we were like okay cool and then i had to raise my hand because i am just that much of a going yeah but you're eating um yogurt and he goes what about it and i go it's billions of bacteria in a milk matrix so yeah i got thrown out <laughs> anyway he did not like that he was just one of those guys that was just a bit too you know one of those people that are just a bit too high on their horse oh well no anyway why are bacteria important uh, because they have they help us get the carbon and the nitrogen we need to live see a lot of the times uh we can't get this keep in mind our atmosphere is actually mostly nitrogen um if you look at a pie chart of how much of uh, oxygen is in the is in our atmosphere it's not a lot we have more nitrogen in the atmosphere but the problem is we can't use gas form nitrogen we can't use it at all so no matter how much we breathe in we're always going to be kicking nitrogen back out because we can't accept it that way into our body so we need something called nitrogen fixing which is what bacteria do for us they actually will take the nitrogen in the atmosphere and then they'll put it into foods and other things that other animals and everything can get so we can get that that nitrogen so we need nitrogen. We need nitrogen to make a lot of the proteins. So if you're one of those exercise buffs and you like the big muscles, thank bacteria because they're getting the nitrogen that you need to make the amino acids to turn into proteins, to turn into muscles. Yeah. So that's why you should be thankful for these bacteria that are doing all the wonderful things of nitrogen fixing. So that's what it's called, nitrogen fixing. So the, you know, ammonia, uh, nictifying nitrates nitrates denitrate uh, so basically like nuts legumes so peanuts nitrogen fixing bacteria in the peanuts and then you know that's high nitrogen stuff like that so we get nitrogen from the atmosphere into our systems because of bacteria so thank you bacteria for turning nitrogen into food for us carbon cycle is very similar there is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and we don't really entirely like it in our bodies with so actually what we breathe out is carbon dioxide but we need carbon the backbone of pretty much every molecule if you remember from last semester that we have is carbon it's all carbon so how do we get that carbon again bacteria do this for us is they actually will take the carbon dioxide or and and turn it into areas that we can actually take it and use it so thank you sorry ah. so thank you carbon dioxide and nitrogen or actually thank you bacteria for helping us with carbon dioxide and nitrogen getting it into our food so we can eat it and live so Let's again go over the good. So prokaryotes also interact with humans and other organisms in a number of ways that are beneficial. Like I said, they're major participants in the carbon and nitrogen cycles, as I was just explaining. They produce nutrients in digestive tracts. We actually have good bacteria that live in our digestive tracts that help us break down food. So, and they get a cut of the percentage. So they get to live rent-free in us as long as they help us break down our food and get the most nutrients out of it and they get a cut of the food and everybody's happy. Which is why, unfortunately, if you um, have to be put on antibiotics for any reason, you're going to have very runny poops. Because, unfortunately, antibiotics, as if you watch the, um, the video, uh, the Kurgerstatt's video from last week on viruses on the T4 bacteria phage, this guy. Um, you know, unfortunately, antibiotics acts like, kind of like a carpet bomb. It kills everything, including the good and the bad bacteria. And that's why, you know, you need probiotics to put back into uh, your system to get that healthy culture going again. Um, so how we make cheese, bread, wine, beer, yogurt, all of it is from bacteria. And I don't know about you, but 
you know, I like me a good beer. So thank you, bacteria, for helping us with that. Um, microbial bioremediation is the use of prokaryotes to remove pollutants. We actually do have bacteria now that will go in and eat spilled oil. We actually engineer them in the lab to do that. They'll actually go in. So if there's a big tanker spill, we'll actually dump these guys and they'll actually eat it. And um, they won't harm the environment and they'll just turn into part of the environment. So it's actually pretty cool. Uh, nitrogen fixation. Um, again, I can't stress how important this is. We eukaryotes cannot pull nitrogen from the atmosphere. Um, so, um, but they can give it to us and we get it through various crops and um, animals that we eat as well. So thank you. I, I Like I said, bio, nitrogen fixation is one of the big ones. If all the bacteria were to die, we'd be screwed big time because without nitrogen, we just, no proteins. And what are we mostly made of? Proteins. Yeah. So bacteria, good. We love our bacteria. Bacteria, good. Except for the Black Death. He wasn't too happy with us. You were bad. But I will cut him in. Good bacteria. All right, the bad. This guy. So, um, unfortunately, there are records of infectious diseases as far back as 3000 BC. Uh, you know, BC stands for before cell phones. That was a bad joke. Okay, moving on. So anyway, um, a number of these were caused by bacteria. Uh, the plague of Athens, that was typhoid fever, which is by Salmonella and Tysica. This is why one of the Salmonellas. This is why we cook our chicken. Um, bubonic plagues, the Black Death. It's this guy right here. His name is Yersinia pestis. And interestingly enough, um, uh, they've been new research has been coming out about this bad guy. Uh, what happened is we think, you know, rats got, or it was like, oh, it was, it was rats and fleas. The rats got around because they were infected and the fleas actually, no, we, we did a, um, kind of turned a lot of the, uh, how this guy got around killing so many people. Um, um, it's just, it was, interestingly enough, we did some computer models to match the records we have of the time. Um, and the rats being the ones, the vectors of the bacteria that carried it around actually did not match the records. Same thing with the fleas. Um, it was human to human transmission. So with fleas, that was the one that matched that of the computer models. It matched uh, the records that we have of the era. So yeah, we think actually the rats were getting a bad rap. It was this guy being transferred by fleas from human to human, not rats. So leave the rats alone. Um, Zoonoses. So these are diseases that primarily infect animals, but can be transmitted to humans. Um, this is where flesh eating bacteria came from. Um, also botulism. Um, so occasionally if you weren't cleaning up after your animals, again, as I stated, viruses and bacteria and, and living together and, you know, crappy sanitary pun intended so um yeah so botulism usually pops up from you know people living in feces and it getting into food and all sorts of fun stuff so anyway then there's staph so staphylococcus again right here so caucus means it's uh you know circular also called staph, um, can live in the human body, uh, easily treated with uh, antibiotics. However, unfortunately, there are um, penicillin-resistant staphylococcus, which is the MRSAs. And MRSAs are not good because if they get inside of you, we have no way to kill them, which is why, again, if you watch the Kyrgyzstaff video from uh, last week, we're trying to use these guys to kill these guys so we don't have to use um antibacterial medicine so much so trying to use we're trying to use the ancient enemies of the bacteria the viruses to save our lives so it's kind of interesting with that said um you're gonna have two um videos oh yeah okay so we're we're at the end here so let me go ahead i'm not gonna we're 
you're going to get, you know, the HP5 versions of this. And I know a lot of you are going, but it's not working. We keep doing it and we get bad grades. And it, even though I got a 100, I'm looking into that right now. And I am really sorry about that because it's a pain in the rear end. And it's got to be something I'm doing on my end, but I'm not sure what it is. So I'm going to, the one thing I can think of is this, HP5, these files to make it interactive and everything is really cool. And it gives you the option of you guys being able to retake, but it seems like if you like, you get a question wrong um, and then you, you know, go back and retake it and get it right again. Um, it only takes the first thing. It doesn't take that new thing. So um, that new grade from you fixing it. It seems to take the first time around when you do it the first time around, it seems to take that grade and that grade only, which is dumb because in the back end, what I'm seeing, you can, I can make it so you guys can retake it to get a better grade. So I don't understand why if they put that option in there, it persists that it, it like like I said, if you miss a couple and then you hit the retry button and it, you retry it and get it 100, why it does that. So I'm going to go in and fix a lot of the grades. I do apologize for that. I am fixing the grades. Um, it's just a pain in the posterior. And I don't understand why it's doing that. And because of that, you know, I'm trying to get to the bottom of it. Keep in mind, you're kind of my guinea pigs and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. So yes, please keep letting me know about these issues because it helps me um, make a better class for you. So uh, like I said, I'm going to be going in. I'm going to be fixing a lot of the grades. Uh, so don't panic and go, oh, God, I got a crappy grade. I failed. Oh, no. I'll no, no, no. If you did it, I'm going to go in and give you 100s um until i figure out what the heck's going on with this thing so as soon as i figure that out i'll let you know because this is crazy and it's vexing me muchly but anyway with that said i am going in i am looking into it i am fixing this i hear you so yes please keep letting me know remember also when you're sending me things and you're going i don't understand why this isn't working Please kind of try to tell me the following. Try to tell me, like, what are you working on? Are you doing it, trying to do it on your phone? Are you trying to do it on a computer? Uh, what type of computer is it? Is it, is it a Mac? Is it, you know, um, a regular computer? Is it a Chromebook? Um, although I don't consider Chromebooks computers. Uh, is it a tablet? Um, what opera, uh, what, um, not operating system. I don't care about that. Um, uh, what, uh, browser are you using? Is it, you know, Chrome? Is it Firefox? Is it whatever the heck Microsoft? Oh, what is it called? Edge, Edge, well, Opera, one of those. If you don't know what the freak I'm talking about, that's okay. Um, and take a screenshot. Those are the best ways you can help me. Like if you have the issue up on your screen, take a screenshot and email it to me. Um, with that information, that's really, 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 really uh, important um, to help me figure out what's going on so I can try and fix it on my end. Like I said, I'm going to go talk to a specialist about the H5Ps and see what's going on with the grades and see what they say about this. So I am getting it fixed on my end, um, or at least I'm trying. So with that said, um, yeah, keep on messaging me when you get issues, take screenshots if you can, shoot it to me, and I will get back to you eventually. And I am currently looking in and fixing the H5Ps, but I'm going to also go back and fix the grades for last week. Okay. All right. With that said, if you've got any other questions or comments or anything like that, or more biology memes, uh, please, you know, email me, message me through your mind. Let me know. And um, you guys take care. Don't get sick like me. And I'll see you next week. Bye.